I assume most of you here have finished the Sun one. So how is it? Is it tough? Is it a piece of cake? That's just a starters. So today we're gonna talk about so first let's recap what we talked about last time. We went over the concept of of C V, which we did in the blackboard. So C V is basically a mechanism for a thread to temporarily give up the exclusive access and then after wake up regain the access. Right? So I, I think most of you have used C V in the uh, in the either RW log or the synchronization problems. So here is the, the example we went over last time, how to use CV to implement semaphore. Basically the condition there is just to check if the count is zero. And we also talk about how to use CV to implement the producer consumer problem, where the condition here is the state of the buffer, whether it's full or it's empty, right? And we also talk about reader and write lock and how to, what's, what's the conditions for reader and writer to enter the critical section, and how to avoid starvation by also uh, stop the reader if there is writer waiting, right? And so, t so that's just, that's, well, that was just some quick recap of last time. Today, we're gonna talk about mostly about assignment two, right? I will give you an overview of what the assignment two looks like, and then we'll go to the details of the system core in C OS 161, how it works in this particular system. And also, uh, at final, I will give you some hint about what to talk about in the design document. So, assignment two, as you already know, the design document is due this Friday, right? So, I think the, both the code reading questions and the design, design document are due on this date, right? Is that correct? Yeah. So you better get started very, very quickly before um, the deadline. And we have implementation, which is roughly, um, how would say, three weeks after that. And you have to implement all kinds of this course. I mean, just to give you an overview. So don't panic at this point. I mean, you may see or too many this course, but once you get a hand of it, to implement them is just. Um, keep doing the same thing basically, especially for the file sys call. So it's really the challenging to get started, but after that, you will find yourself more comfortable to when implement the system calls. Um, so, so let's go to the first uh, part of this call. What is a system call anyway? Anybody? What is what is a system call? We'll keep talking about system call, system call. What is it? What is it? It's, it can be many different concepts or def definitions, right? So what, what um, ultimately, what, what, what is the system core? It's uh, basically a service offered by the operating system, right? So it's a way for the user la layer program to request certain kind of service from the operating system kernel. For example, the service could be hardware related, for example, access a, a certain block in the disk, or it, it could be software related, like allocate some memory, or create a new process, and all that. So basically, system call is the interface between the user process and the operating system. System call defines what kind of services is offered by the operating system, right? There are all kinds of mis mysterious stuff about a system call, for example, which we will explain them today. For example, how does the user trap into the kernel space, right? We know that there are normally two, at least two different modes of the hardware. One is a normal mode where the uh, user program is running, and another is privileged mode which the kernel is running at. So how to transit between them, how, um, how the user program can trap into kernel. And how does the kernel know it's a system call, right? System call is just one small uh, category of all the uh, inter interruptions. It could be, so for example, how the kernel differ differentiate if the interrupt is caused by divided by zero or is a system call. And also it could be a time interruption, for example, if the kernel wants to do scheduling. So whenever there is an interrupt, the kernel has to know what just happened, right? whether it's a system call or other exceptions. 
And also, how does the user tell the kernel what, what the user want to do, right? How does the kernel know whether the user want to open or read or write? Or for read and write, how does the kernel know where to read from and where to read it to, right? How does the user tell the kernel all that information? And, and finally, after the syscall is done, after the kernel has offered his service, how does the user get the result of the syscall? For example, if user want to open a file, how does user get the file descriptor, right? How basically how the kernel, uh, how should the kernel return the result of syscall to users, right? So you can take these slides for a little bit, like one or two minutes, and think what's the, um, what's the way to do it. I think Jeff, cov Jeff covered most of it in the class, did he? I mean, maybe some high-level concept, but not such details, right? So let's take a look at it by wanting through an actual syscall example. In this case, I choose time because it, uh, it has return values. In the, in the assignment to instructions, there, there is example of reboot syscall, right? It, it is also a syscall, but the, the reboot doesn't return you anything. You call reboot, and the system will reboot. And nothing will return. So here I choose another example, which is time. So basically, you want to get tell kernel to tell you what time is it, right? So if you go to this uh, file, you will see a time function. It's a library function. So inside it, it is just call on scope on scope time. It's actually a system call. So you can see um, from the call signatures, the on scope on scope time are supposed to take two parameters. Right? Another, one is a pointer to a time variable. Another is now, meaning we do, just don't care. And the on-scope, on-scope type are supposed to return a time t. Right? So this is the signature of the syscall. Actually, you can see that in the menu. Do you know that OS161 source code shipped with the menu you can see? So it's in the main page, main directory, sorry. So if you, oh. So in the source directory, there is a subdirectory called man, which has all kind of subdirectory with bin, diff, libc, and misc. I think it has also has a syscall. So it's basically a bunch of HTML files describing the signature or the prototype of the syscalls. You can find the prototype of onscope onscope time here. So it as like as we have analyzed, it takes two parameters. One is a pointer to second, another is pointer to nanosecond, right? It's supposed to return a time t. So you can see that if we call time like this, that means that I want, to, I want the kernel to tell me the second, right? How many seconds since epoch, which basically a time, fixed time point, some point in the, in the past, and I don't care about nanosecond, right? And if you um, go to this source code and try to find the definition of this on-scope, on-scope time, you will end up finding nothing. So let's, uh, it's in user lib, lib c time, time.c, right? So here, if, so if you have used c tags and jump, you will find there is actually another function called on-scope, on-scope time, but that's not where this function is used. Actually, this whole compatible directory is not used at all. So this uh, function is actually a system call. So let's take a look at how sys system call is defined in the user space. So as you can see in the slides, it's defined in this assembly files. Um, build user lib libc syscall.s. Oh, it's awful. Let me. Make the font a little bit smaller. Is this better? Can everybody see? Is it too small? Okay, good. So, so in this file, you can have uh, you you will see a couple of diff, uh, interesting things. First of all, we have a macro here, which is called syscall. It has two arguments. The first is symbol, and the second is syscall number. So before we go to in the, 
go into the detail of the syscall, let's first see how this macro is used. So here we define a syscall macro, right? And after that, you will see a bunch of syscalls defined using this macro. So we see the name is fork. For example, in this, the name is fork and number is zero. The name is v fork, the number is one, and so forth. Right, you will see all kinds of, all the syscalls are defined here. And right below, you can see time. So we use this macro to define a function. And the symbol is underscore underscore time, and number is 113, right? So let's go back to the syscall definition, see uh, what this line is, want, what does this line want to do? So we go to syscall, here you can see it defines a label. The name is just a symbol. So in our case, the label is just on scope, on scope time, right? Remember that you see the function is just where the instruction starts, right? So this one defines uh, a function. It's called on scope, on scope time. And inside of the function, what we do is we first jump to another function, basically call another function, and in the it is a MIPS caveat that this instruction has to get, get executed before the first jump instruction. So the, the, the function first load the number into, um, the, into V0. So basically save the call number into V0 and jump to this another syscall function. So inside of this function, this is, the, here starts the instructions, right? This line is just a label. I mean, give a name to the instruction. And the second line is actually the instructions. So first, we have an instruction called syscall. And there is um, a question in the coordinating questions asking you about this, right? So what happened when the CPU executed this instruction? Any idea? So this is one MIPS instruction. And if you Google it, I mean, I already did that, but if you Google it, you will find that this is, yeah. It uh, looks at the V0 register and not go to the code. Is that, is that complicated? I mean, it's one instruction. What does it do? More like it, yeah. So it, it's basically any, I, any other source before I jump into the, Authors, I mean, what does this, is this instruction do? So if you Google around, you will find that this instruction is called a software uh, interruption generator. So it generates a software inter inter interruption. So normally, instruction on CPUs are generated by some unintentional uh, cause. For example, I unintentionally divided the, the number by zero. I will trigger interruption, the kernel need to handle that, right? But this one, it means that I want to trap into kernel. By putting the, this instruction here, that the program wants to tell the kernel that, hey, I, now I want your intention, I want your service. So basically, this instruction will trigger an interrupt, right? So that answers our first mystery, which is how does the user program trap into kernel? How does the user program tell the kernel that it needs service from kernel, right? It's by this instruction to raise the, the attention of the kernel. And just like normal interruption, so I think Jeff uh, covered this in the class, when there, when there is an interruption, what happened? Regardless of it's divided by zero or by syscall, it's an interruption. After the interrup interruption happened, what will happen? So the CPU is running, there is an interruption, then what happened? Nobody? Yeah, after the interruption, what happened? It continues? <laughs> then what's the point of the interruption? It interrupt, right? No, 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 yeah, how, so, when, so, okay, so interruption is two time point in the history, right? Interruption starts, Interruption end. After the inter interruption, it continue execution. But what happened 
just after the interruption was raised. Exactly. We, so first thing we do, we enter privileged mode. Remember, we have two modes of the CPU, right? So first, we are in normal mode. Whenever the instruction, the first thing in the hardware we do is enter privileged mode. Then what? What's that? Yeah, so the hardware need to record what just happened, right? Because there are various reasons for interruption, right? Well, the hardware need to figure out what's the reason and save it somewhere so later on kernel can figure out what just happened, right? So basically, that's, that's more about, that's more or less it. So on the interruption, the hardware will first enter the privileged uh, mode and then record the state, basically what just happened, the cause of the interruption. And then the, current, the hardware will set the instruction counter to a particular predefined location. So in this particular hardware, the MIPS hardware, this location is OGX 8 million, right? So the hardware will set the program counter, the PC, to that location, and the CPU will start reading instructions from that location. This is all hard-coded, right? And then, what's there in this, uh, in this address? What's that? Handler, yes. Basically, or interruption service routines, or whatever, whatever the name uh, is. So basically, when, when we boot up the kernel, the boot up process will first place some small piece of code in that particular address. Right? So whenever there is an instruction, who gets the control? The user program or the kernel? Um, kernel, right? Kernel has to take control of the system and see what just happened. And let's go to this. This is, will be the last file assembly code we need to look at. Um, so kernel arc MIPS low core exception S. So you, you can read the comments here. You don't have to understand the format or the syntax of the assembly. You don't, you don't need to. So you can just look at the comments here to figure out what this assembly code are supposed to do. So basically, this explains the procedure. And we first save all the stuff, save all the context, all the user registers. And then finally, you will find we jump to a function called MIPS trap, which is Fortunately, a C function, right? So let's go to the C function. It's in the same directory, but trap.c. So in this function, what do we do, right? So we have a trap frame, basically record what happened just before the interruption, right? And then we get the exception or interruption code, basically represent what type of instruction it is. And we do all kinds of stuff for now, just ignore them. So now we are checking the instruction type, right? If it's a hardware interruption, we do something. And if it's not, we continue. And here we check if the in interruption is a syscall, right? There is another uh, coloring question asking you how to determine the interruption is a syscall, right? So we check the interruption code, and we found it's syscall, so we enter here, and we basically call this syscall function, right? Then we go to the syscall, which is defined in the um, syscall.c file. So we have the call number. The call number is v0, right? Remember before in user space, what, do we, what did we do just before called the syscall? We load some number into V0, right? Here you can see why we store the number in V0. So because this is kind of a protocol saying that, hey, user, please put whatever the call number in a particular register, in this case, V0. It's agreed by the kernel and the user, right? And then the kernel will examine that register to figure out what the user want to do, right? So what the user want to do is the first of piece of information that user program should tell the kernel, right? And then, uh, and then what? So for example, the user would tell the kernel, uh, go back to that example, I want to get a time. Okay, time has a particular call number which is 113, 
right? Now what? The kernel need to know, okay, where you want to store, where you want me to store the time, right? The time is two pieces of information, second and nanosecond. Where do you want, want me to store them, right? That's basically, the user already passed that in the arguments, right? So if you go back to here, the user already tell, hey, store second, store second in this variable and discard the nanosecond. That's another second piece of information that the user need to tell the kernel, right? So we got the call number, the kernel figure out, okay, this is the time, syscall, so I, I do a switch on this call number. For different syscalls, I have different handlers to handle them, right? If it's reboot, I do reboot. If it's time, I do time. So I basically call my handler here, right, in this file. Now imagine you want to handle open. What do, what do you need to do? Cas is open, I call my open handler. Right? Cas is read, I call my read. Right? You basically, what you need to do in this assignment is add a bunch of more Cas branches here and add your own handlers to handle them. So here we, um, we have a handler for time, it is this function, and interestingly, we um, pass a0 and a1 into the function. So now it all go back to the argument passing. So back to the second question, how does the user tell the kernel program where to store all this information, right? So if you take a look at the comments here, this whole chunk of text, it will tell you exactly what's the convention between the user program and kernel how, on how to pass the argument. So this slide basically summarizes uh, the convention. So uh, when the syscall has, uh, uh, so different syscall have different number of arguments, right? No matter how many arguments you have, this is the rule to post them. If you have less than four 32-bit argument, just put them in A0, A1, A2, A3, right? So if you have more, you say you have six argument, the first two will be put in A0 to A3, right? What about the remaining two? The remaining two will be put on user stack starting at this address, right? That's, that's what the comments said. And what about 64-bit argument? Right now, we're, we're only dealing with 32-bit argument. Right, so a 64-bit argument will occupy two registers. Right? It, that, it will only be placed in aligned registers. By aligned, we mean either is E0, E1, or E2, E3, right? Two aligned registers. It cannot be E1 and E2. They are not aligned. This is the convention for arguments. And we are talking, we will discuss the return value later on, but this is the rules, basically, E3 indicate if it's success or not, and V0 is for a 32-bit value, and V0, V1 is for a 64-bit value. We'll get, come back to this later, okay? So, so basically, the first bullet is the convention for the user to tell the kernel what, um, what are the detailed information the kernel need to know. For example, where to store all these time variables. So for, let's take the, a few syscall examples to get familiar with this convention. So in this case, time is simple, right? So we have two arguments, both are 32 bit. Where should we put them? It is A0 and A1, right? So A0 will be the second, and A1 will be the nanosecond. What about open? Open, we have three arguments, file name, flag, and mode. All of them are 32 bit. Right? So we put file name in A0, flags in A1, and mode in A2. What about this one? LSIC. You may think LSIC only has three arguments, right? So A0, A1, and A2. But that's not true because the second argument position is offset T. If you go to the definition of offset T, it's a 64 bit variable. Right? So here, we will put the FD, the file descriptor, in A0. And because the second is a 64-bit, so A1 is skipped. It's not used. So position will be put in both A2 and A3. 
right? Then we, um, then we run out of all the registers. We only have four, right? For the, for, for the final, yeah. We put the arguments one by one in order. So, so this is the special case, right? This is a special case where the, the third argument is uh, happened to be an integer where you can put in the um, second register. What, what if the width is also a 64-bit um, argument? In that case, you want a principled way to find all those arguments. You would want to, to give it this function, I found an argument this way. That function, I found arguments that way. That's not, that will not scale, right? So for all the functions, no matter what your argument looks like, we have one rule to do them all, right? We just found the arguments sequentially. Yeah. Stack. So, you, so when you handling LSIC, you know the interface of LSIC. So you know how, you know exactly how many arguments are there, right? So you know the first is FD, the second is position, and third is once. You know there will be only one thirty-two bit variable that put in a stack, and the starting address of that variable will be fixed at SP plus sixteen. SP, yeah. SP is the stack pointer. Characters? File name? It's a pointer. Pointer is fixed sized. Yeah, the, the address. Right? The, the string or char array could be variable size, but the pointer is always four, four bytes, fixed sized. Any other questions? So everybody know how to at, at least get the arguments from the user space, right? So let's go back to the code and see here. Now you have a better idea of why we are passing A0 and A1 here, because these two contains the information passed by the user. So A0 is basically where the second should be, and A1 sh is where the nanosecond should be, right? So now let's go to the handler. Basically, it use it first get a time, and then copy out this time to user space. Now another question is, why do we use copy out? Why not just assign it? We know that this is the pointer. Right? Normally what we do is we do this. Star user second pointer equals to second. That's what you may attempt it to do at the first place, right? Why don't why do, don't we do that? Why do we use when all of, all the trouble to call a function to just assign a variable, right? You will need to think about it in the code reading questions. So here comes the whole topic of why you use copy in and copy out. So first of all, what is copy in and copy out? So as a name suggests it copy in data from user space to kernel space, or copy out data from kernel space to user space. So basically data transfer between user and kernel space, right? You wouldn't use them allowed in this, in this assignment. And so let, like just we said, why do, you, do we use copy in, copy out? If we just want to assign a variable, why, why not just assign it? Or if we just want to copy a chunk of memory, why not just memory move? Why do we use a special function copying or copy out? Any idea? Yeah. <laughs> you are changing the kernel code. Actually, that's what you do in this assignment or in all the assignment. Exactly. User can be naughty or can be bad, right? You have no idea what the user want passed in, right? You know where it is, but you don't know the value. Or you you'd have you cannot expect the user is well behaved and always give you the correct value, right? Either the user is malicious or passing some bad values on purpose, or a user is just a dumb. It 
by mistakely, by mistake, passing some other bad values, right? You don't know. So for example, I open a file. I supposed to give you a name, right? But instead, I give you a nine pointer. If you go ahead and, and access that nine pointer, what happened? You have interruption, right? At the kernel, you have interruption, interruption, and that's not good. I mean, you are not supposed to have interruptions at all in, inside a kernel. And also, when the user wants to read this file and put the content at a memory location, and that memory location happened to be your interruption handler, right? Remember, whenever there is an interruption happened, this whatever instruction are there have control, right? Whatever user loads some his own program on that location, and and so later on, when, whenever the instruction, the user have control of the system instead of the kernel, right? Or similarly as write, the user may um, dump whatever the memory is to the file and examine the content, right? So the bottom line is that you cannot trust the user program. Whatever you read from user space, it cannot be trusted. You, you can pre-assume it will be bad. So that's why we use copy and copy out. So this function will handle this case. So what this function does is that the function will uh, first try to access that memory or that location the user specified. If something bad happened, it will regain control, right? It's like um, more like a try catch block in Java, right? I try to do this. Whenever something bad happened, I got I got a control instead of just to throw out some other interruption. Right? I want to have control of the whole process, right? That's what this copy in copy out does. And you want to use them whenever you are dealing with the user space, especially the pointers. Right? Remember in the time, the user tell us to store the time and nanosecond in that two location. By location, we mean pointers. Right? Whenever you are dealing pointers, you always want to use copy in, copy out, no matter what. So we copy out the second value to the pointer Remember that if something bad happened here, the copy out will get a control. So the copy out will behave like a normal function. If it fails, it won't cause any interruption. Instead, it will just silently return you a, a error code. Right? You check the error code. If anything's wrong, I'm done. Right? Then similarly, you copy out a nanoseconds. Here, um, here because we call time with a now, what will happen here? So inside this copy out function, the kernel will try to access now. That will trigger an interruption, right? But internally, it handles that. So as, as a caller of it copy out, we don't know there is an interruption or not. We will notice that the result will be not zero, meaning there is some error. Right? We just return that. And But at this time, we don't care. I mean, the user passing a now because the user don't care about nanosecond, right? So it's, all, it's fine. And we go back, we check the error code. Um, so we break out from this switch. Right? So now we know how does the user um, trigger or trap into kernel? And how does the user tell kernel what to do and how to do it, right? Now this, um, we or we reach the third part, which is how does the kernel, yeah, one second, how does the kernel return the information to the user, right? I don't know, why you pass it using the user TPL? Oh, I think there is a question about that in the code ring question, right? I, I can't remember exactly, but I think, so the idea is that you can name whatever you want to a type. You already see that in some zero. Why do we call it unscope unscope time t? You can call whatever you want. You, you want. It's just a name, right? Deep down in the lowest level, it's just int or int or char, right? So this is a, just a fancy name for a pointer to let you know that to remember to remind you that this is a user pointer. That's it. Okay. Now we the kernel has finished its service. Want to and the kernel want to return information to the user. So as we discussed before, for return values, the convention is 
what it's really indicate if this is called success or not. The V0 or V1 should, should, are supposed to contain the uh, return values, right? So here we check the error code. If there is an error, we set a V0 to the error code and I set A1 to A3 to 1, indicating that this, this is called failed. Otherwise, we, we um, set V0 to the return value and see A3 to 0, indicating this is called succeed. Then we return. Or, and before we return, we advance the EPC, basically the pr program counter, so that the user won't get stuck in the Cisco instructions again. Right. There is also another code ring question about this. I'll let you figure out which one. So any questions about the Cisco process so far? So everybody know how to get the information information from user space, how to get the call number. Call number you don't need to worry about. Right? This whole framework has been set up for you. All you need to do is add plug in your own handlers, right? But you, it's helpful to understand the whole process. I mean, how does a syscall finish? Or what's the whole lifetime of a syscall? Yeah. Can you go over um, how to get uh, something from the stack? Something from the stack? Yeah. Uh, I can't. You need to figure out. So basically, in C, given the address, you can get the value at that address, right? So in this case, what's the address of the, for example, in LSIC? What's the address of the whence, the third variable? SP plus 16. Where is SP? What does SP stand for? Stat pointer. Right? It's all here, all trap frame. So if you go to the trap frame definition, you will find all kinds of registers. This is basically all the registers in the CPU. So when did we set this up? How do we magically get a trap frame? Right? So whoever called this function have a trap frame. Where, do, where did we get that? Remember, when, whenever there is an instruction happen, what's the hardware we do? Save the context. What is the context? The context is basically all the information just before the interruption, which is all the registers, all the values of the register, right? So Trefram, uh, inside Trefram, you will find uh, this one, SP, right? So you know the value of SP, you plus it by 16, you know the address of that once variable. And you are you're about to fetch the value from there. Remember, this is also a user pointer. Right? You don't know where the, uh, the stack pointer is. So what you should do? Copy in. Copy in some value from user space. Right? OK. So now we have finished everything as part of the kernel. We have get the syscall, we have served the syscall, we have set up the return values. Now as the user, how the users are supposed to get all those values? Right? The kernel has already um, stored all the values in the, either the registers or the, yeah, or the, in the registers, E3 and V0, we we one. Now let's go back to the very initial assembly file we look at it today with here. So user used this instruction to trap into kernel. Right? Before that, the user has already stored the call number into V0. So the, so, so the kernel know what to do. Now the kernel returns. So as you said, as someone, someone mentioned, the exec we continue execution after the interruption as if nothing happened, right? So we get to this instruction, what do we do here? This basically means branch if equal, okay? We check the value of A3. Why do we check the value of A3? Because that's where the kernel put 
the flag in it, right? If it's one, means fail. If it's zero, meaning success, right? So we, 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 we check value of E3. If, so you don't read the assembly code. Read the, in the comments after that. If E3 is zero, core succeeded, right? So we jump to, into this location, and then we just return. If it's not a zero, then something bad happened. So we store the, error, the v0 in the variable called error number and load the return value to be negative 1, we return. That's why in user space, whenever you call a function, when something bad happened, you will know that the return value is negative 1 and the error, error code is stored in a global variable called error number. That's how it's accomplished in the, in the, in the library. Remember, this is all in user space. This assembly code is in user space. Right. That's why it uses a syscall to trap into kernel and get that information or get the time information in our example. Okay, return value, check these two files. So now, what's the big picture of the syscall? What's the lifetime, life cycle of the syscall? So first, you as a user program, the user put all the information the kernel need to know in some predefined registers, right? In this, in this case, A3 and A0 are put in the arguments, and V0 is a call number. Then the user uses this call instruction to trap into kernel, right? Then the hardware takes over because there, in, there is an interruption, so hardware will enter the privileged mode and save the context, basically the trap frame, right? And then, as a kernel, the kernel need to identify the reason of the interruption and dispatch the syscall to various handlers. Right now, there are two handlers, reboot and time. You are supposed to add more handlers to it, right? And then um, when, the, when you finish handling the syscall, the kernel will pick up the result in some predefined registers, again, in A3 and V0, right? Then we re go back to the user mode, and the user mode will pick the result from these registers. So this is the whole picture of how a syscall happened. Any questions? I mean, I, mean, I know this is a, maybe a lot to you to digest, but you need to understand this before you can be comfortable with all this syscall handling stuff. Otherwise, it's very easy for you to get lost. I mean, you don't know, have no idea what you're doing. You're confused whether you are writing user code or kernel code. One rule is that whatever you write is kernel code, right? For example, in this uh, kernel arc MIPS syscall syscall C, this is definitely kernel, right? Any questions? Let me see. Okay, so this is uh, just a tip of how to add a syscall. Like we said, you, you, you just create some file, C file, Define your handler there, and uh, add that handler in the switch case branch. Right, basically in that switch case branch, you uh, you uh, insert your own handler there. This is just um, some technical details of how exactly to enter the C, to create the C file and the header file. Let's first let's first jump back jump to the design documents. If we have time, we can go back and take a look at this. So for design document. It's a two-page PDF file, and you need to describe all the important issues in this assignment. So basically, how do you design the file descriptor and the, and the file table, right? And how do you synchronize the concurrent access, right? For a same file, may, there may be two processes that concurrently access this file. How do you synchronize? And you need to describe basically for each syscall, open, read, write, read, and write what you need to do. You don't have to go use code. I mean, you just have a bullet that open. I will first do what? Find, maybe find available file de descriptor. Then I will do what? So just use English, not code. And also, we require you to describe a second scheduler uh, in the design document. And lastly, how you, your partners are pl uh, plan to break down the work between you. Maybe one do file syscall, another do process syscall, or some other um, work breakdowns. 
So basically, when we're writing the design document, we have a checklist to see whether you have described this, whether you have described that. You want to make sure you covered everything. So let's go back to this. Uh, so you want to put your syscalls in separate C files, right? For example, one, type, one possible organization could be put all the file related syscalls in a, name, in a, in a C file named file syscall and put all other process related syscall in another C file called a proc syscall. And then implement your handlers in that um, C file. And the third step is very important that whenever you add a new C file, you need to add that file entry to the configuration file. So that when you do BMAC, it will be compiled. And create a header file, declare your open prototype, and include that header files in syscall.c where you will insert your handlers and dispatch for sysopen. In so here, um, basically you want to do cas sysopen error equals to my sysopen, something like that. And, and this function should be um, implemented by you and defined somewhere and break. Uh, you can take a look at the sys time. You can see that sys time is defined in another C file called kernel sys call time sys call C. Same thing, right? Just use as use this as a template and implement your own sys calls. So that's what I'll, I have today, and we can discuss uh, afterwards if you if you have any, any questions. Thanks.